Welcome to the video recording of session one of the Luther Movie 2003. For this session you'll need two resources. The first resource is called Study Guide Getting Ready to Watch the Film. In this video it is also called The Character Guide. Here's what the first page looks like. Please be sure to read through this resource prior to watching the movie. It has a cast of characters guide showing a photo of each character and an extensive description of their role. In you can always pause this video, download and read the guide, then watch the movie and come back to this video of the study session. The second resource guide is called Luther 2003 Study Guide Thoughts Following the Film. Please note that the front page looks very much like the previous resource. There are two small differences that will ensure that you have the correct document now for this part of the study session. Underneath the picture, the title of this document is Luther 2003 Study Guide Thoughts Following the Film. This document is 10 pages long, while the first resource is 12 pages long. Please turn to page 10 of Luther 2003 Study Guide Thoughts Following the Film. This is where we began the discussion. The first question was, what were your first thoughts, impressions, and reactions to watching the movie? Well, was it the Vatican? The, kind of the court place. Anyway, uh, it reminded me of January 6th, actually, a few years ago. But I didn't realize there was that much. Well, I think it was, there was a little a... bit um, packed together. This wasn't mm -hmm. so quite so close as the movie shows it. Yeah. And I think that was mentioned in here. Yeah. 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 That comes to 30 year war. Right. So there's the Peasants' Revolt. <clears throat> And you're right, that's an alarming thing that most of us don't hear about in our studies, either in the sermons or in catechism. There was a lot of raw brutality because of all of this that happened after. We'll get into that. Bob, you were going to say something. Well, well, the, it was typical Hollywood. Like, it had, it had all, all the elements, sort of. You know, it had the violence, for sure. And, you know, it had a plot. And it had the starring character, well, one main character, basically. And uh, it even had a marriage in there. Right. Mm -hmm. These, yeah, so the events that are portrayed in the film are mostly historically accurate. And yeah, there's going to be dramatic license. We all know that. You know, it's mm -hmm. always going to be that way. Um, so yeah, you, Moira, you're right. You know, there's there's a lot of things that we're going to get into that yeah. just seem very violent. Yeah, and but that's the way it was. It was. That part's a, it was. Yeah. It was. It was. Yeah. yeah, it was. The Saskatchewan legislature yesterday oh. yeah. and protesters yeah. who were in the gallery yeah. interrupt the business of the province. Yeah. So they weren't violent, but the police were there too, and we yeah. see all kinds of things going on in this country that uh, we don't have to talk about January the 6th. There are many things going on. Shots fired at schools in, uh, in uh, Montreal, you know, so this is not the Middle East, but, you know, we have our issues too, so. That was the first time in Saskatchewan history that the, they had to shut it down. Yeah. Never was shut down before. Yeah, and although I hadn't, I'd known that there had been an uprising, I didn't realize how violent it yeah. was as, as mm -hmm. it was portrayed. But, you know, look, thinking about it, it makes sense because humanity hasn't changed a damn bit. No. <laughs> <laughs> and the numbers they quoted in the movie, I, I, between 50 and 100,000. Well, died. that's not surprising, really. It was quite a. It was, a, it was really a violent thing because the Vatican wanted to brutally suppress it. <clears throat> what, the movement and uh, mm -hmm. that was kind of what was there. Yeah, so as we get into this, remember just the political situation. Luther was this upstart young monk going against the Pope. And at that time, don't forget from your history classes, you probably remember this, all the ecclesiastical and political power was consolidated in the office of the Pope. The Pope was like the Pharaoh and like Caesar. 
in his time, and Napoleon in his time. Everything was comp um, concentrated in the office of the Pope. And so in the middle of all that, the Pope even says, Leo X says, you know, you or not, it's Kajetan, I'll get into him later, says, Luther, you're trying to destroy the church when the Turks are coming from the east. You all realize, of course, the Turks was the way the Germans referred to the Muslims. Mm -hmm. The Turks were the Muslims. And so um, that again hasn't changed, you know. Um, so there's a lot of contemporary aneous stuff that happens today that is still reverberating from over 500 years ago. What surprised me, though, was that the Vatican was actually waging wars. Oh, yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. Because it was about land and mm -hmm. politics. Um, power. 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 And, and all, some of that hasn't changed. The Catholic Church is still the largest landowner um, in the world. Hmm. Just out of interest. What else? First impressions. What else? Sometimes um, when they zoomed in on uh, Luther, they made him almost sound like he wasn't quite there. Or look like it to me. Which parts? When he was, you know, removed. He was just there. <laughs> like, is he going to act or is that going to be... Not happening. Yeah. When he's fighting the devil. <laughs> yeah, we'll get into the fighting the devil part. But I think sometimes, remember, so you have to understand, again, you know, Bob, you mentioned Hollywood. This was made by, or produced and funded by Thrivent for Lutherans. So years ago, you probably bought a Lutheran life insurance policy or faith life or whatever it used to be called. And, one t and then it morphed into Thrivent in the United States and globally. And so, Renata, you point out something that may have been a bias of the filmmakers. That blank stare of Luther could be interpreted as, as putting him up a, a, a bit on a pedestal. Is that what you're kind of referring to or not? No, I almost, Just, me, almost looked like they think he wasn't. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit. Not quite there. Well, probably. In some, yeah, in some yeah. sense, you would, yeah. because it was in a different realm. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, I want to start at the end. Um, and if I can make sure this all comes together here. Um, at the end of the movie, the, the version I gave you had all that German text at the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. Did you see all that? No. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, yeah. So... Um, the music was long, though. Yeah. So I imagined it had all that text in it. Yeah. There was text there, so yeah. I just want to see if I can bring the English part. I found an English um, version here. Bear with... There it is. Okay. So, at the end, there's that text that scrolls, yeah. and this will be that text in English. Mm -hmm. So it serves as a good introduction, because it's at the end of the movie. bad because so Bob at the end of the movie there's scrolling text that says what happened at Augsburg pushed open the door of religious freedom Martin Luther lived for another 16 years preaching and teaching the word he and Katrina von Bora enjoyed a happy marriage and six children Luther's influence extended into econo economics politics education music and his translation of the Bible became a foundation stone of the German language. Mm. Today, over four, 540 million people worship in churches inspired by his Reformation. 
All right, that's a very good introduction to all of this because the the extent the extent of him saying, "Here I stand; I can do no other," has been quoted ad infinitum mm -hmm. all through the ages, and that was almost 600 years ago. And the idea of being bound to the Word of God and by His conscience is the clear thing that we need to think about. So we'll get into all of that in a moment. All right, so let me see here. Um, I should turn this off so that... Yeah, okay. So let me just... <coughs> if you pull out your character guide, that would be good. And we'll just go through the list of characters there. Um, yeah. So does everybody have a copy of that? Okay. So we'll go to where it says Johann von Staupitz. Renate, am I pronouncing it even remotely? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, okay. um, so, you'll note that this particular individual plays a large role in the movie, right from the beginning to the end. And um, this is a historical character. This is Luther's father confessor. He's the one that Luther would go to constantly in the monastery and, and confess his sins. And finally, one day, Staupitz, it's not in the movie, but Staupitz says, Luther... When you have something worthy of confessing, come to me then. But until then, don't come to me. Because Luther would spend two and three hours in confession with Staupitz. And finally, Staupitz had enough and said, go, when you commit real sins, um, go and don't bother me. So he's got this um, really good relationship. And historically accurately in the movie, he does have a really good pastoral relationship with Luther. You, that's evident all through the way that he cares for Luther, including loving him, him enough to kick him out so that he is released from the bonds and then he can take care of him in a different way. He even so, gave him a horse, didn't he? Um, he did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, to, to yeah that's right. Horse. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then um, the Elector of Saxony, Frederick the Wise. Um, now, who, who's the actor that plays this guy? I, what, Max von? No, it's not Max von Sydow. Peter Ustinov. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is where it gets really interesting. Um, when you watch the movie, you will notice that um, in one of the scenes when. Oleander, I think, confronts Luther and says, "You and gives him the letter that says, you know, you got busted. The Pope wants to see you." And Luther says, "Well, I'm just a, a an innocent, loving son of the Church." And what's the response from that fellow? He says, "Welcome to the world of politics." Yeah. Right? And so Luther is blissfully unaware of all of that until the guy tells him look you know now it's not just religion now it's politics so this is the and this guy um, the way he's portrayed is a wise cunning man who has a wealth of experience which has given him diplomacy in the best sense of the word foxiness He's pretty foxy. We'll, we'll get into that later. All right. And listen, feel free to add whatever you would care to add. I'm just kind of going through this um, just as a review of the material you've already read. Um, so Spalatin comes a little later. Um, let's see. He's one of the fellows that is kind of a, um, well, it says, you know, became the court chaplain secretary to Elector Frederick the Wise. And he has enough guts to tell Luther some things, but he's also telling him to beware. 
and be respectful of the elector, um, the Peter Ustinov character. Andreas Karlstadt, um, this is interesting because later on, what happens to him later in the movie? Does anyone remember? What does he do? He's one of the uh, person who wrecks everything. Yeah, he pushes. So, have you ever noticed from your study of history and politics when the pendulum swings and people push against the pendulum? There's always, you know, when one group pushes the pendulum, they push, 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 and then another group tries to push back. And what happens? You push against the pendulum, and what happens? Pretty soon the inertia of the pendulum goes, and you don't control it anymore. It just swings out of kilter. So what happens here is, you're right, Renata, Karlstadt wanted, he's, remember how he defies Luther and says, I was just sticking up for you. But then they started all of that throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Luther, as you already know, never wanted to um, split from the church. He wanted to reform it. And so Karlstadt basically wanted to throw it all out. And that's where the altars got thrown out, the crucifix. Remember, he grabs the cross mm -hmm. um, from the individual, tells everybody to burn their robes. Um, he is illustrative of and symbolizes the radical reformers. And there were any number of them. Today, the remnants of the radical reformers include Pentecostal, Baptist, Mennonites, Anabaptists, the Dutch Reformed, um, the Alliance Church. That's the remnants of the radical reformers. Because remember, if you go to their, their churches, what's missing at the front? There's no crosses and no altar. There's no altar. Okay. So there's no crosses, no altar. Um, there's no organ in a lot of cases. Um, not that that really matters, but no artwork, nothing. So the radical reformers said, and by the way, they also believe that the sacraments have no power. Baptism and communion have no power. They're just symbols. We believe when Jesus said, this means it, this is my body, this is my blood, is means is. And you can't say, if Jesus wanted us to think of them as symbols, he would have said, this symbolizes my body, this symbolizes my blood. So that's why you get all of that happening. So Kostad is kind of the personification of all of that. And then we come to, I don't know what page this is on, but... Um, page yeah, there's no page number. So go to the page that has Philip, and then how do you pronounce the last name, please? Melanchthon. There we go. And well, how did you learn it? Melanchthon. Okay. So we were taught at the seminary just the anglicized version, Melanchthon, which is not <laughs> of Deutsch. Mm -hmm. So Melanchthon is. Um, one of the key architects of the, of the Augsburg Confession. And with Luther, he doesn't get a really prominent part in this movie, but he was important in the Reformation. Um, some called him the second Martin. There was Martin Chemnitz, um, Philip Melanchthon, and Luther, the big three in the Reformation. Um, but Philip... Melanchthon really has an important role because he's the one that gathers the princes together and they stand up to the Pope at the end of the movie or not the Pope, the, um, the German emperor, um, the elector and say, and they're, they're all guys that bow and say, okay, we're not going to sign this. Um, we'll let you cut off our heads before we do this. So Langton's the one that kind of got all of them together. And we'll get into the, even the politics of the signing of the Augsburg Confession. And then, Bob, you mentioned it earlier, um, every Hollywood production has a bad guy. <laughs> and Tetzel 
is our bad guy. Um, and they do a really, really <laughs> good portrayal of him. Pretty much everything that comes out of his mouth is historically documented, including what was the, remember that one thing that he said when the sales were going down and just before he meets with his little consort and they're looking, they're hearing Luther's influence and there's the sales are going down and in a desperate attempt to raise more money, he tells the people that he has the power to tell them that the, the indulgences they're buying are so powerful that they would forgive what? You'll remember as soon as you hear it. You'll know. It was shocking. So he actually says... The, these indulgences are so powerful, they will forgive any man who violates the Virgin Mary. Oh, yes. Oh, really? I didn't hear that. He says it in kind of an underhanded way. It's almost like a throwaway line in the movie. It's quiet, and you can tell that the actor portraying it was accurately portraying the shame. As soon as he said it out of his mouth, Tetzel realized how stupid that sounded. How pathetic it was. That's the desperate attempt that they had. Well, I always thought Tetzel was a master salesman. Yeah. Oh, you know, absolutely. Like he, really had it, he really had it down pat. And that's why the, that's why the, that's why the people kind of fell for it. Oh, it'd be brilliant. And then, you know, he's the guy who invented the, you know, when the coin, when the coffer rings a soul from Purgatory Springs. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not kidding about that line about um, if, and I'll give you the, I will find this. If you want to go watch it again, and maybe we will, because, um, yes, 4111, because I, you know what, I want you to believe what I said to be true. So let me just go to that for a moment. Let's see here. Is this it? Yes. All right, 4111. So, um, let's see here. Okay, so I need to turn up the volume. So, the licensing, the way this whole licensing works, we can show brief snippets without um, breaking the law here. So 4111. Yes. So this is this will give you the context. German money for the German church. The St. Peter line at German church. Or St. Paul. Or any of the holy apostles. With this indulgence, I can absolve any sin. I can even save the soul of the man who violates the mother of God herself. <laughs> you see the, reg the look on his face? He realizes that was incredibly stupid. So th there's, there's all of that, and that's actually been documented. That was really said. Um, there's all kinds of historical uh, information. People were taking notes. The discussion then moved on to the topic of church-wide meetings to determine all manner of issues. The question is, what happened to the delegates? So in those days, um, the diets, which were conventions or convocations or um, councils, um, any one of those could take months to years. And the delegates wouldn't stay there for more than a week or two at a time. And then they discuss matters and then be told to go back to their location, discuss it with others, bring back notes, and convene again. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember how many times that Diet of Worms met until they got to the day of, you know, the supposed recantation. 
but it was not uncommon for any of those things to have um, to be months or years long, but only several weeks at a time to meet. And then they'd go back and back and forth, back and forth. And sometimes not even the same delegates would attend a second or third time. And so you can just imagine in those days, yes, you know, you'd get all the information and then you'd go back home and then a different set of people would come and they'd get together. And maybe it was all different people. You'd have to start over again with getting everybody up to speed. They didn't have the luxury of having all the documentation we have these days. Okay, um, we've, we've kind of talked about all of this. Um, if so, why do you think it bothers you? If not, why doesn't it bother you? Um, the watching of the film Curious to Learn More About Church History and, and the Life and Times of Luther and the Reformation. So, um, just listening to all of you here today, there are, pardon me, there's more resources written, books, movies, journal articles, encyclopedia entries on Luther um, than other than Jesus. Luther is the one that consumes the most study material simply because of the ideas. And I, Renata, you can tell us, in Germany today, um, it's Luther's place politically is different than religiously. Is that correct? Well, they uh, still have the German um, church, but right. then they broke off the, uh, the refer not the reform, but the new Lutheran church that are more like Lutheran Church Canada. They've divided up from the from the state church, church. state church yeah. where you actually had to pay so many percentage of your income tax and to make this work. Mm. It wouldn't work here. Mm -hmm. Okay. The church is run by the state, or, or it was? No, oh. it was just financed that way. Okay. Well, you know, we paid the paper. Okay. So, like I mentioned, there are tons and tons of materials. I think what I'm going to have to do is, just for supplemental information, PBS has a documentary that's pretty accurate. Um, be very careful um, because some of the material takes um, Luther off on a bit of a tangent and um, it gets a little dangerous and, and I'll get into that another time. Um, okay, let me just... Westgate Books quite often has like a whole shelf on Martin Luther. Oh really? Oh. Yeah, based on Louise Street there. They usually have yeah. and they people must take them, read them and resend them back. Or, oh. Yeah, because they change quite a bit. Have you read them all? No. <laughs> no, I'd like to, but I just haven't. No. <laughs> okay. Well when we were getting ready for the uh, commemoration of the well, did Luther's work? Wait, wait, hang on. Katerina, you know, what her character was like. And it, that wasn't put, portrayed properly. I mean, this was not the smoochy couple that they showed. So, yeah. hey, pardon me, but my history might not be too good, but did Luther's work at translating the Bible predate King, the King James Version mm -hmm. for English? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, I want to turn to pause the video here and turn to page 7 of 10 in the Luther 2003 study guide Thoughts Following the Film resource. We talked about that. Okay, so if you turn to um, the study guide. The front page says study guide thoughts following the film. So I want to invite you to turn 
to, hmm, it's a page that says, so there's a picture of um, the craftsman and his wife and his son who committed suicide. I don't know what page that is. Oh, it's um, page, um, page six. Okay. Go to page seven then. <coughs> So one of the things, you know, we talked a lot about in the PR, we talked a lot about trying to identify themes in society that are happening um, that come up in the movie. And one of the things that runs through the movie is the whole affliction by the devil. Luther gets it, you know, at the beginning of the movie, he's tormented you know, by his own guilt. He's tormented as the night before the diet of worms with self-doubt. Is he really right? That kind of thing. Um, the tormentation of the suicide individual. Um, so, um, that the top of the, that page seven, um, let's see. Along with prayer, which is oratio. Do you see that? It's the middle of the page, uh, the middle of the first line. Along with prayer, um, so this is, this speak, this paragraph speaks to Luther's development as a theologian. Someone who studies the scriptures so that he can learn about God. Theology, of course, is the study of God. Along with prayer, which in the Latin is oratio, and study, which is meditation or meditatio, and testing, tentatio, and auf Deutsch anfechtung, or affliction, is considered a critical element of makes, what makes a true theologian. And in, in our church body, we want our pastors to be pastorally caring, but also to be theologians. So we give a lot of time to educating pastors so that they can speak competently about the interpretation of scripture. By the way, there's a hint for the sermon on Sunday. Um, you'll recall the parable of the talents this past Sunday. Um, I got pulled aside by a couple of people after church who asked me this hypothetical question. Well, what would happen to the first two servants who invested the money. Remember, they were the people that invested the money. What, lost. what happens if they lost? Mm -hmm. And the investments went bad. So, you got to come Sunday to find out the answer to that. Because <laughs> I bet all of you were wondering the same thing. If three, so I had two people after, and Moira just mentioned it now, we were all thinking about it. So, I will answer that question on Sunday, but you got to be here. <laughs> That's the cliffhanger. Okay, so um, these things are what make Luther a theologian and what are supposed to make all pastors theologians. Prayer, um, prayer time, study time, testing, you know, um, and affliction. Um, Luther saddled with his own affliction meets his, this family, that's the suicide one, at the crossroad where theological study intersects with the messy lives of people afflicted by a fallen world, death, and even demonic harassment. Um, we live in a world where... Yeah, the I, sorry? They, they basically think that have tried to debunk the idea of a devil, really. Yeah, um, and sometimes demonic possession um, is is thought of as a psychological malady or a psychosis of some sort. And there's a really fine line, and I mean really fine line. My understanding is that even in today's world, every archdiocese, every diocese on earth in the Catholic Church has at least one priest who is trained in exorcism. You never know or hear about it, but... That's my understanding. 
So we live in a world in North America where we kind of debunk that. But if you go to Africa and talk to Christians there, they'll tell you demonic possession is, is spot on. It happens. Um, in fact, I had a, a professor who was a missionary for 20 years after he graduated from the seminary, went to Africa and told us numerous stories about how um, in the middle of the night in the village where he was pastoring, um, the next village over, there would be seances and, and Satan worship, um, satanic kinds of, of acts. Um, and one of them he told us about was they put in um, to the ground um, tent pegs that had essentially gargoyles on them, which is a common thing. Um, and you put them in the four compasses of the earth, and when you stepped inside of that line, inside of that square, the temperature went 50 degrees in a different direction, either hotter or colder. Uh, and then when they got too near to a fire inside that kind of a square, um, the fire burned, but there was no heat. And he would tell us that they would invoke the names of all these false gods, and people would be possessed and would be screaming, pretty much like what happened in the New Testament. You get to North America, and um, one commentator I read said, the devil does nothing but parlor tricks. So I don't know if you've ever seen The Exorcism, the movie The Exorcist. Have, have you? Have you? Yeah. Half of it. Okay. We could not. We went to it when we were fairly newly wed, right? And I said, I can't. I can't stay. Okay. We went home. And it was so powerful, I couldn't sleep that night. I could have sworn my bed was rising. Like, that was how Murray thought, yeah, how crazy are you? He didn't. It didn't hit him the yeah. way it hit me. I can't watch the new one. There's a new version of the exorcist. Yeah. Movie. And I thought, no, I'm not going to watch that. Because I haven't even watched the old one after all these years. Well, I remember when... Yeah. No, it was so powerful. It was, yeah, it just seemed like it could grip you. Yeah. Yeah. And he thought he was chipped because we left the show. I didn't like, see the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I can remember when it first came out, and it was a, more of a spectacle for for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, they went to see it because everybody else wanted to see it. Yeah. Did you see? <coughs> what did you think? I didn't know that. Hmm? So that's the thing that makes <clears throat> the view of Satan in North America different than in other parts of the world. When we think of you know all the special effects in the movie, the spinning head, the throwing up, the the walking backward, all that. I haven't seen it. I've only seen clips because I too I don't think I can handle anyway. Um, and then you, you hear about what the Bible says about Satan, um, that he's leashed. He's on a leash. He has no power. And the movies um, show us show him as somebody who's, um, who does all these parlor tricks. I think um, in other movies, you know, a family is eating dinner, and then they get called out into the living room for something, and they know the house is possessed, and they walk back in, and all the chairs are on the table. Housekeeper. And, yeah, could have been the housekeeper. <laughs> they walk out and walk back in, and the chairs are stacked on top of each other, all in a row, like just in an instant. And so the house is possessed. It can do all this stuff. When really, in North America... The devil has to act a lot smarter than that. How many times have we heard people say, did the Bible really say? Does the Bible really say? And then you fill in the blank. When was that first said? In the history. In the Garden of Eden. When the devil says to Adam and Eve, did God really say? And since that time, that phrase has caused more problem than anything else did God really say that's the devil talking 
literally casting doubt. He does the same thing to Jesus. Does God's word really say that? And that's how Satan works in North America. And that's where Luther gets afflicted. Um, Luther's vitriol, now this is the middle of the paragraph, against the devil throughout the film fits well into St. Peter's additional advice, resist the devil. So let's turn to 1 Peter 5, verse 9. Hey, that's not bad. We're over an hour into the study and we finally get to the Bible, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What did I say? First Peter five nine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Is that right? Yeah. Let me just see. First Peter five. Yes. Okay. Actually, let's let's go. First Peter five, verse six, <clears throat> all the way to eleven. Let's read that. First Peter five, verses six through eleven. Somebody read that, please. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion seeking, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you to him be the dominion forever and ever Amen. okay so in the context of the movie Luther is being assaulted by the devil here um, his faith is being tormented questioned he has self doubts that's all satanic that's all the devil talking to him and remember in the movie and this is historically accurate he does, I think it was in a sermon, and by the way, one of the things that's not correct in the movie, and this goes to what you were saying, not historically accurate is the preaching style. There's no way those priests ran around like modern day pastors sometimes in the midst of the congregation. They never did that. You'll see, there's even a scene in the movie where they're, they're, they're watching Luther up close, and behind him is what? The pulpit. Mm -hmm. And those of you who, who have ever have been to the church in Haltain know that the... It's way up high. Way up high. That's a very um, a Lutheran kind of, well, Catholic kind of mm -hmm. um, stance. They valued the Word of God, and they would put the priest up to preach, we would say, looking down at the people. And now our pulpits are not that high. They're a little lower. Um, but no way did the priests run around the way Luther was running around in that movie. So... Um, well, they try, try, so probably tried to portray that Luther was with the common people. Yeah, oh yes. That's oh, yeah. what he wanted to touch. <clears throat> yeah. 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 Yeah, and again, dramatic license to make that point. Yeah. You bet. <clears throat> so... Um, this is the context here is Luther in the movie is being tormented and yet here the words again of the very first in the Catholic Church the very first Pope Peter we don't believe he's the first Pope um, but he said Peter writes humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that the proper time he may exalt you um, lift you up Casting your, all your anxieties in him because he cares for you. In the movie, Luther's portrayal of the love of God to the mother of that little girl who was walking with crutches is outstanding. 
it shows and com and and the compassionate nature of Luther as a pastor. Um, and he says to her pretty much the same thing: cast your anxieties on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Um, and then be sober-minded, be watchful. And then here, Peter says, your adversary is the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. In North America, we, we don't think of him as a prowling lion. We kind of make fun of him um, at Halloween. You know, there's all those costumes with the devils. Mm -hmm. um, you have the blue devil um, baseball, football teams, red devils, blue devils, um, and they look cute. Um, but he's like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And then verse 9, resist him. How? Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brothers and sisters throughout the world. And after you've suffered a little while, and notice there's a time limit. Um, suffered a little while. Um, the, the words little while. Um, you are all familiar with the Old Testament passage from Ecclesiastes. To everything there is a season. There is a time. Um, a time to, for war, a time for peace, a time for love, you know, all that. Um, and didn't the birds do a song, time, yeah. all that kind of stuff? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's interesting that the word time there in the Old Testament and likewise here a little while um, the literal translation of that Old Testament word time is season when we think of time there's no real beginning and end but when you say season now you got something seasons in Saskatchewan are very definite there's four of them um Although the old, how's the old joke go? Two in Saskatchewan, um, yeah. winter and construction, you know, yeah, that kind of yeah, thing? Or, construction. Yeah, yeah, whatever it is, yeah. Um, but you have a season. And so here Paul says, um, after you suffered a little while, uh, for a season, the God of all grace who has called you to his, so suffered for a little while. Luther's suffering was for a time, for a season. And every one of us goes through a season in our lives of suffering. Sometimes the season is long, and sometimes it's short. But it has a definite beginning and an end. And it's quite good. I, I, I heard that he suffered from depression. Like, I, I don't know about that idea. Yeah. That was a historical thing, too. It said, that he was, it said that he was depressed in the later part of his life. Yeah. <clears throat> so I want to save that for the next okay. session because um, the movie doesn't cover the last 16 years no. and there's some pretty controversial stuff yeah. that comes later in life um, including that depression yeah, yeah. so a um, little season of suffering and the promise that Peter gives us from God is after you've suffered a little while the God of all grace has called you to eternal his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And so there's some question. Is Peter talking, what's he talking about when he's saying, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you? Is he talking about this life? I think he is. But you could make a very strong case that he's talking about eternal life as well. It's a both and thing. So in this life, the Lord will confirm, strengthen, establish, and restore you. And then in the finality of eternity, he will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you in himself. To him be the dominion, the rule, forever and ever. Amen. All right. We've got 15 minutes. I wonder if anyone has any questions or discussion at this point that they want to bring up. We should always have time at the end for freewheeling discussion. In the 1500s, the uh, general population would not have been educated or well-educated at all, right? Yes. Uh, 
And so they would believe whatever the church told them. It, this is what they were supposed to do, like that woman and her child yeah. when in the movie, <coughs> and Luther said she didn't have to do that. There was a she was you know, didn't believe that at all. Yeah. Because the church was you know, the one who would give out the, the information and the general public would follow along. Um, you know, and and she thought, you know, not doing this was a risk that she might not want to take, so can I piggyback on that or finish yeah. what you're going to say? Yeah. So you're absolutely right. So even the mass, the worship service, was not in German. Latin. It was in, always in Latin. Mm -hmm. yeah. And because of that then, now the sermons I'm not sure about. They I don't were all know. in Latin too. Sorry. The sermons yeah. were in Latin? You sure about that? I'm fairly sure, yeah. Those Before things. Luther? Huh. I don't know. I... But it was in Germany. I, I think yeah. the liturgy or the, the probably the liturgy would have been in in Latin. Yeah. I'd have to, I'm gonna have to check on if the sermons were in German prior to Luther. Because okay. remember what Luther did. Remember he spent all the understand. Right. And so mm -hmm. you know and so even the indulgences were all in Latin. They weren't in German. They were in Latin, mm -hmm. the language of the church. But the revelation and again so much of Luther's story is revolutionary to the nth degree. You know, here we've got one man's faith in God wants the greatest revolution of all. Um, the whole notion of having the Bible in your own language is mind-blowing. We take it for granted. Mm -hmm. And not only do we have take it for granted, can you do you know how many versions there are of the English Bible? Oh, brother. There's hundreds of them. Yeah. And so when, Murray, when you, you know, ask whether or not they, they would not have had, until Luther comes up with his translation of the, German, of the Bible into German, they had no access. And so you can just imagine what that would do. The pen really is mightier than the sword. And to give the Bible in the language of the people... That's what ticked Rome off. Because now they can read for themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's one of the hallmarks of the Reformation. And so that's why even today we tell our people, you better, you have the power to check what, I, what the pastor is saying as to whether or not it's correct. And you have a duty to make sure it's correct. Because if it's not, we got a problem. Were there other people at that time, other than Luther, that were had the same thought as <coughs> something's wrong here or not? Well, yes, Calvin, there were. Calvin. Well, I don't know if he was at, was he after Luther? So John Calvin. Yeah, Calvin and Swingley, They all. It was all in the air at the time, and they all came a little later. Luther was the one that kind of started it all. Yeah. And then Utrecht, the guy that gets burned alive, the Dutch reformer, um, he, well, he was burned. Um, that part's accurate. But there were a number, it was in the air. You know how movements happen and it just gets into the air? So I mentioned Johann Hus earlier. Larry Michalchuk is a member of the Johann Hus Church there's on the he's it's on Facebook. Johann Hus was about a hundred years before Luther, and my I grew up with stories about Johann Hus. Um, my dad told me he was Polish, and my dad came from a little Lutheran town in southern Poland, northern Czechoslovakia. It was a border town. Um, his they had a. Lutheran cathedral there that seated 5,000 people and his confirmation class was 125 and that church has been in existence since 1650 and I got to, we were there in Poland in 1975 and I was learning how to play the organ for my church and my dad, I don't know how he did it, but we got into the <laughs> organ there and I got to play this massive pipe organ in my dad's home church. My dad was bawling his eyes out because he remembered all that from when he was a little kid. Anyway, so 
now my dad's telling me stories about Johann Hus and apparently and it sounds much better in Czech and Polish than what I'm going to tell you in English you know how every language has a poem that's idiomatically better in the original language I'm going to butcher it in English but apparently the word Hus means swan and um, Hus said about Luther that you, you will burn the swan now, that's him, because Hus was burned alive for saying pretty much the same thing as Luther a hundred years before. But he was burned alive. And they said, you, you will cook or roast a goose now, or a swan now, but a hundred years from now will come someone that will burn you. Now, I don't know if that's apocryphal. Did Hus really say that? Who knows? But when I hear my dad tell this story, it sounds so great in Polish or, or Czech. And we're going to have to get Larry, um, when he comes next time, to tell us about that, because he knows a lot about that. In fact, when I first met Larry, um, he was telling me about this connection to the Johann Hus Church nearby. And I, I stopped. I, I did a double take. Wait a minute. You know about Johann Hus? And he looks at me and says, wait a minute, you know about you? Nobody knows he, about you. He's Czech. He's Czech, yeah. yeah. And so my dad's connection with that Czech town and Larry being Czech, um, we had an instant bond because we are probably the only two people in this part of the country that know who Johann Hus is. Um, and so we were laughing about that. So we'll get him to tell us. So to answer your question, Anne, directly, yes. Um, and then it kind of spread like wildfire. So it was in the air a hundred years before with Johann Hus, who started asking the same questions and started beacon off, and they caught him in time and burned him alive. Um, and then, and then once these ideas start percolating, they spread like wildfire. And then, so then, like you said, where there's Calvin, um, and, and everybody else, Calvin, um, in Scotland, um, John Knox, you know, every country has a kind of a, um, somebody that championed that cause. Utrecht, um, all the Dutch reformers, um, Meadow Simons, Simons, you know. Yeah, I don't yeah. know what year that was. But that comes later, that comes later. But yeah, I think so. it, once it, once the domino effect happens, boy, the whole thing is falling <laughs> apart like dominoes. I think so. I remember that Luther and Zwingli actually had interaction, but they couldn't agree on the theology. So you say that again? Zwingli yes. and Luther. Yes. Yeah. And we had some friends here from, uh, from Switzerland. They could not go to a Lutheran church. Now they're back in Switzerland. They're going to church. <laughs> yeah, there was, yeah, there was a meeting to bring the Reformed church that is all the radical reformers together with the Lutheran church. And that didn't ha and then later the government tried to force the Lutherans and reform together and that didn't work either. Mm -hmm. But we'll save that for another time. So yes, Anne, to answer your question, it's in the air and we'll talk more about Johann Hus next time and hopefully Larry will be able to be here and give us the straight from the horse's mouth, as it were. So then next time, we'll get a little bit more into the later part of Luther's life. We'll talk a little bit about um, the radical reformers, um, his, his um, difficulties in life, some, some say mental illnesses. Um, we'll talk a little bit about his... Um, just the end of his life and some of the things that he said that get kind of a really bad rap um, but have to be understood historically um, and then you start understanding um, how, why. how did he die? He wasn't very old. No, he was how 1546 he um, and I think it was colic. Does colic happen to adults too? Mm -hmm. Or cholera? Was it cholera? Well, I can't cholera. remember. Cholera. Pneumonia, yes, pneumonia, that's right. And 
And he did end up going through the Black Plague and was a pastor to many people with the plague. So. I think he went out physically. Yeah, yeah. he did. All right, any last questions? All right, thank you so much for coming. I'm so glad you all came.